church. Hallelujah. He's our Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalms 37 and 4 says this. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires and secret petitions of your heart. Well, let's delight ourselves in the Lord this morning because, listen, this word is true, and it's effective, and it is powerful. The anointing of God rests upon it. And when it flows through the heart of a regenerated man or woman and comes forth from your lips, it releases the power of God to change things, to heal things, to bring you back to health. I'm telling you, God is alive, and he's opening up the church like never before in this season. Amen? Amen. Man, I had one of the greatest, uh, uh, well, I, I would think it was the greatest compliment we could receive last night. We had some friends over, and they go to another church, and our neighbors, and, uh, and they was talking about this church. I don't know, a lot of people talk about this church, but anyway, what I'm saying is this. And uh, somebody asked her about the church, and she said, it's the most Pentecostal church I've ever been in, and I, the most Pentecostal church that I know of ever, and I've been in a lot of churches. And I got to thinking, I believe that's probably the greatest compliment you could ever have. Amen because the church started on the day of Pentecost. Yes. And there was 3,000 saved because of Pentecostal experience. There was 5,000 saved on that day because of a Pentecostal experience. Yes. I, I would say the greatest thing you could get in this time, in the 21st century, with the church being totally dead in most areas of the world, would be have a Pentecostal experience. Yes. And, and when I say that, I'm not making light of that. I'm talking about God's bringing back to the church the nine gifts of the Spirit to begin to operate, bringing back things that are faith like never before. Yes. Faith is being birthed in the heart of men and women. The Word is being revealed by revelation. Wisdom is coming like never before. Why? Because God's orchestrated and set the season to bring it back alive. On the day of Pentecost, what happened in that upper room when the Holy Spirit coming empowered everyone and they began to speak in other tongues like they never had before. There was a guy named Peter that was always messing up. He was always, as a matter of fact, he denied the Lord three times not long before that. And this experience of the infilling, the power of the Holy Spirit coming over this man and transforming him caused him to stand up on that very day and thousands of men and women come to the Lord because of the indwelling the power of God and the presence of God like, and you can't deny that it's yes. recorded in the book it's right here Amen. so yeah Amen. I'm proud to be Pentecostal yes. but the thing about it is not Pentecostal in name only Pentecostal in action and deliverance of the word of the living God and coming alive and say that God's pattern for building the church is much greater than man's pattern. God's pattern is, is to have an explosion from the inside out. Let the Holy Spirit come alive and it will attract others to know yes, the God that you know. Amen? Amen. Amen? And then when you delight yourself in the Lord, when you delight in the Lord, He'll give you the desires and the secret petitions that you have and it'll come alive because it's been given in the covenant of God and we have a covenant right yes well somebody shout a little Hallelujah. bit I mean Pentecostals shout well praise God we have everything to shout about I'm not bashful or about my God love that song, Oral Roberts. They called it the Oral Roberts song. I was lost and undone. I was without God or his son, but that ain't the case today. We got God and his son. Amen. And on top of that, we 
You've got the third person of the Godhead called the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit dwelling deep within us to bring about a manifestation of God himself through your life. Amen? Well, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. I was just thinking. I was just thinking. Now, listen, listen, listen. Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. Look what the Lord has done. Woo, woo. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. Woo. He touched my body. sing one song and she told Sister Donna she said I had more songs than that and Papa wouldn't let me sing them what do you want to sing this morning you do just one song she's going to just sing one okay just turn around there and belt it out say this is for Jesus this is for Jesus hold your mic up high to your mouth this is for Jesus okay y'all can be seated she's going to she's just going to minister to you in song I know you're going to be blessed Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Okay, do the other one too. I, I just God. sing one song. Oh. Uh, <laughs> please do. Please do. Jesus loves the little children. Okay, come right up here. Oh, oh she, well. Okay, do that one too. You don't know it. You just sang it last Sunday. Well, can you do? Jesus loves the little. Yes. Can you do that? Yeah. Well, put the mic right up close to your mouth and belt it out like you're singing it to Jesus himself. Okay? Jesus, Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. Red, brown, yellow, black, and white. They are precious in this life. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Go ahead, finish your second verse. Now do the second verse. He died for all. Okay? Put it to your mouth. Put it to your mouth. Remember that one. You're so pretty. Thank you. I love you. Okay. Her second verse was, Jesus died for all the little children of the world. Anyway, she's coming up, been trained right. 
When children get old, they'll not depart from the Lord if they're trained at an early age. She loves the Lord, serves God in her own church, and now she's going to be moving up here. No, I'm just teasing. Anyway, it's good to have our daughter, Michelle, from Florida to visit with us. They're very active in their own church in Jensen Beach, and uh, her husband couldn't come this time. He was... Uh, one of the fortunate few that have good jobs and he was at a conference so she came here and he went there so we got the best of both no uh he's wonderful he's a wonderful man of god <laughs> recording me praise the lord send it to brother ed <laughs> he is wonderful i love ed but things are good god is great we're in a new season we're no, no different than Moses and Joshua. And I got to thinking about those that chose to remain with Moses dropped dead in the de desert. Only those that was willing to go to the other side with Joshua came on board. If you get, see, there's, there's always new transformation in seasons. And each season is good for that season, but it won't work in the next season. And we need to understand that. Don't get hung up with Moses when God's saying, I want you to come with Joshua and I'm going to do something in your midst you've never seen before. Don't allow your old past religious life because Joshua does things different than Moses to bog you down. Because Joshua has been called as a militant to come up and get the men and women going and cross the Jordan River meet the walls of Jericho and have victory every time he went out. Amen? Amen? That's what the church is called today for. We're facing a very cruel world. The spirit of Antichrist is sticking his head up everywhere. But God's already, already claimed victory for his church. But we have to walk by faith and diligence and obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. Look what the Lord, I was just thinking, I was going to say it to Mark, but he, Vanny, come off on that song. I can remember when we had two people in the praise team. I can remember when this was nothing but dirt in this location right amen. here. Amen. That we took a step of faith about six years ago, didn't we, Brother Mark? All amen. of us. And this, and we got the road graders of earth movers out and just started, you know, just a step of faith. And, and then all of a sudden, God began to develop uh, the New Living Church. Yes. And then people begin to come, you begin to come, and God began to put something inside of you, maybe a little different, maybe something, maybe a, an awakening of, of what's happening and going on. And, and God began to develop this for this season. Everything we've done in the last seven years is for now. And we're ready to roll, y'all. We're ready to roll. You know, in Matthew 24, it says this. The disciples was talking to Jesus, said, I've got to go away, Jesus said. And, uh, and, but I'm coming again. And I, and I got a new revelation yesterday when uh, Karen McKean, is that right? Is that close enough? <laughs> See, it's good to walk in grace. And, uh, and we had a meeting yesterday morning with uh, the conservative Republican chairwoman and the Tea Party and everything, and they, they spoke to us about deceptive practices that's been taking place, that the UN has been given power through certain uh, programs that Clinton instituted, and it started really with H.W. Bush. But anyway, and now we're, we're getting programs that we're going to, Reveal more. Matter of fact, on the 16th of uh, this month at about 1 o'clock, 12 o'clock, I stand corrected, down in Sholo where the little statues are, we're going to have a meeting uh, and, and the... Tea party meeting. It's a tea party. And we're going to have, what, senators? Who? Congressman Gostar? Go Gostar, that's good enough. Sylvia Allen, Barton and Crandall, and yours truly will be giving 
one of the keynote speakers is your truly. Why? We want to stir up the Christian community to let yeah. them see how far off we've allowed yes. misdirection to take us from separation of church and state. If you'll read the First Amendment, it was that the government could not establish a church and make you go to it. The church can influence the government. The government can influence the church. Amen. We're going to... Oh, man, don't get me started this early. We hadn't even taken up the offering. <laughs> but you, you don't have to be in fear. We will take one up. <laughs> don't get afraid now. Yeah, we're taking two today, as a matter of fact. Uh, we've got... Uh, this is the first Sunday we did Debt Demolition Sunday. And we're focusing on the debt that we incurred on this building. And the first three months we did this right through the winter when a lot of people were gone, everything was happening, we was able to reduce our debt by $16,000. And a church this side, that is yes. anything but a miracle. We still have a little ways to go, but I believe by faith that today Dewey's going to put it in the basket. No, I'm sorry, Dewey. I'm sorry. I mean, I mean, you know, the blessing would be great. But anyway, I pick on Dewey a lot. But anyway, listen, we are going to take two offerings up. Now, some of you I know write it on the same check, but I, I like to take two offerings up because I like the debt demolition. I want it to excite you because it's not just a, to wipe out the debt on the ministry building and stuff. It's to believe God that everyone in this congregation yes. is debt free from the Amen. seed they sowed and the wisdom that comes back. Because God said, he'll open up the windows of heaven. Well, I wonder what's behind the window. Opportunities, all kinds of things that God's going to put before you, ideas, That's inventions. It. He's going to open something up if you'll believe God. But you've got to believe God. Don't just come haphazardly and just say, well, the pastor needs a little money. No, the pastor don't need the money. God wants you to walk in obedience to the word of the living God and come and sow it, and we're going to be debt free, and you are too. Yes. Amen? Yes. So I want to encourage you today to have faith in God, in the word. And that's the biggest transformation that's taking place in the church, that we're actually trusting God. We're not just going through the motions. And I mean, there's no better, greater time than to get revelation of how to trust God is or than in this season. Mm -hmm. I'm not making light of what we're facing, but I'm not making light of what our God's already done and yes. empowered us to be. And matter of fact, part of the message today is going to be proper positioning with proper authority. And so I want us to understand that. So I believe we're going to just receive, uh, is it time for the offering, guys? Okay, y'all help keep me straightened out. We're going to do a declaration. Isn't it good that people send in checks to help? You know why? It's good soil. It'll produce those cucumbers like it did in Israel when Israel got back its land. And it wouldn't grow nothing until Israel got it back and it grew some of the biggest vegetables in the world because God was in it. And uh, I'm excited about that. As a matter of fact, honey, bring me up that card. Let me, let me, uh, I won't. Thank you, baby. See, with my military background, I like discipline. I like kids to say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, you're welcome. And if they don't say it in my house, they do the next time. <laughs> Ain't that right, my dear? I don't want no bobblehead in this place. For you newcomers, that's the other daughter. Granddaughter, I mean. That's the daughter over there. I'm going to read this, and I'm not going to tell you who wrote it unless she wants to tell yourself. But This is encouraging to me. 
because we meet a lot of opposition on this mountain. But I'm convinced we've heard from God. I'm convinced that the word of God works and I'm convinced that men and women just like you need to hear it. And if you're wrong, you need to be corrected. And, and if you don't know, you need to be taught. And if you've been taught and you've been corrected, then you need to be exhorted to move on, move forward in the things God's given you to do. Dear Pastor Boyne, thank you all for this. I won't say who did this. Thank you for so warmly welcoming me to your spiritual family, the New Living Church. I just wanted to tell you that your last three sermons were not only outstanding, but the best that I have ever heard. It was not just your delivery or content, but the Holy Spirit that emanated from within you. There is no doubt that you're touched by the Lord. May God continue to bless you and give you the physical strength for your spiritual journey. Amen. Well, I know Thank you, Lord. that I'm touched to God, but I know you are too. Amen. And I know God lives in me, but I know he lives in you. And my whole issue in life for 30 some odd years is to try to get people to understand God's living in them. <clears throat> God's with you. It's not some big preacher that he's in. He, not that I'm a big preacher. I didn't mean to put my... But what I'm saying is this. You're the body of Christ. God has moved in. He's taken up a bold within you. He has equipped you. He quickens you. He gives you revelation. He speaks to you. You're, if anything happens in the earth, it's going to be because of you and God together. Yes. You see... So, I believe right now, as we make our declaration, this summer, we're going into, we're in April already. We're going to be in May before you know it, in June. It's going to be the greatest summer you've ever had because of your obedience to God. It will open up things to you. I declare that what the government says that this place is null and void of any opportunities, that God's going to open opportunities up, not our government. Yes, yes. I believe God is the one that we serve and is our source and brings our resources. I believe with all of my heart great opportunities to the man or woman that will believe will begin to happen this in the very near future, in the next month or two, you're going to begin to get an opportunity you never thought would come. Your families are going to turn around, fall on their face, and serve God. And the worst ones that you thought was lost forever is going to come back asking you and telling you the seeds you sowed in their life made the difference. You see, Isaiah 55, 11 says that the word of God is not void. But it's powerful. It, it'll accomplish what God has sent it to do. What did he send it to do? To transform men and women in their lives, in their thinking, in their spirit man. To make it available, the power of God and the presence of God to do mighty exploits as the body of Christ in the earth. Well, it's been too long since the body awoke. But the body, there is a great awakening going on today. This will be the greatest day of your life if you'll let God come in and speak to you and bring you a new, fresh revelation and equip you to do the work of the ministry, as the Amen. Word says to do. Amen? Yes. You all ready? Amen. Believe in the seed. Believe yes. in the principle. Believe in the law, and it will work for you. Okay, let's make a declaration. You all ready? Amen. As we give yep. today's Amen. offering, we're believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, businesses and better businesses, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, settlements, estates and inheritance, interest and income, rebates and return, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money and bills paid off, debts demolished, royalties received, supernatural increase on investments made, and souls for inheritance. It's offering time. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.
second checks. Anybody got a second check? Second checks. Okay, put y'all's hands down. Third checks. Third checks. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's been too long. People get too uptight about money. If you'll gain the control of your thought life over money and boss it, it'll never have to boss you again. Amen? Gain access over your money and boss it. You tell it what to do. Never allow money to make your decision for you or tell you what to do. You make your decision as it comes from God. You make your decision from that inner unction of the Holy Spirit. Do not go and let money make your decision. It always winds up bad. You make the decision directed by the Holy Spirit and you tell your money what to do. And today, you may want to tell your money to go in and that your seed to produce a hundredfold and that you can be debt-free, that you can go full-time and help the pastor. <laughs> See? We had a guy yesterday, Sam Payne. I believe he's going to start coming to the church. Brother Sam, is a, he speaks out on uh, a good speaker. He had a radio program for a year and a half down the valley. Matter of fact, uh, he and I are going to tag team up here. It looks like we're going to get some talk radio going. Uh, he's he's uh, very up on the conservative movement in the political arena. Uh, also, I'm up on the biblical side of that, and uh, we're going to just try to stir up something. Uh, people need to be woke up, stirred up, moved up. <clears throat> And, uh, and radio is a good way to do it. And uh, we're believing God for that to happen. Uh, it's a small area up here, but you've got to stall. Don't begrudge small beginnings. Let God begin to start something, and then he will uh, expand it. He'll bring the provision to do it. And so remember, on the 16th at noon, be down there. I don't know what I'll be talking about, but probably I'll find something. I have to pray myself to sleep at night. 
because I'm praying for all the liberals that's going to be out of office. I don't know what they'll do. I feel sorry for them. The Mayan calendar ends December the 21st, 2012. I don't know if that means their civilization is going to be history, but I know that our calendar ends November about the 4th if we don't vote right <laughs> in the same year. If we don't get the Christian right out, and we need to believe God for candidates to rise up and come out of somewhere that's, that's intelligent, godly principles, morally right, to run for office. And we've got several already on the front burner, but we got to believe God how to get some of these people into office. And we got to believe God to direct us. We can't be like the Christian community was last time. Just throw away all their belief and their faith and everything and vote for just anybody. Uh, you say, is this a political rally? No. This is a Paul rally. The Apostle Paul felt it very important to go to the kings of that time and to encourage them to turn to God. And he got beat up, smashed up, stoned, wrecked, trying to fulfill his mission. That's why I can't understand why pastors get so nervous about talking about the political process. Every one of the disciples were political activists, including Jesus think about it he confronted every government at that time just about to change to come over to do the things the right way this is the right way so I encourage you to pray seek the wisdom of God pray for our nation but first of all we need to pray for the apathy to leave the church and that men and women will rise up and do something that is right in line with this scripture and begin to pray and believe God for something to happen in the church first and then it will affect our nation. All we've got to do is affect the church. Then the church will affect the nation because we will have great success because right now the kingdom of darkness is positioning in itself to deceive us and make us think they've got more authority than the kingdom of light. And they're, they're doing it subtly we learned a lot about that yesterday. And they're positioning themselves to make the church look weak and ineffective. Well, let me tell you something. We're not weak and we're not ineffective. God is moving on us and he's bringing revelation. And I don't care what your background is. It's ta time to stop and quit being divided and have some godly faith and conviction to stand up even if it costs you because it will so I want you to be encouraged today pastor it's so good to have you back today God bless you it's so good to have you back you and the family okay are y'all ready to sow okay will y'all believe okay I want you to call your your debt. What are you believing for? You believing for the credit card debt to be gone? Are you believing for, I don't know what you're believing for, but you need to be pointed in your belief and you need to know what you're doing. And so you don't have to voice it out loud, but inside you need to say, Father God, I'm believing. I'm sowing this seed and I know the word is true and you're going to open up an opportunity to the windows of heaven. Maybe supernatural increase in a way I never expected will come my way. I'm believing you that this debt is demolished in Jesus' name and that I will give you and make sure it's broadcast that you're the source. You're the one that caused it to happen to get me debt free in Jesus' name. Amen? I believe that right now in Jesus' name. I believe God's alive, don't you? I believe the word is true. I believe if we walk in obedience and faith to it, it opens up. I believe Isaiah 119, if we'll be willing and obedient, we'll eat the good of the land. What does that mean? We won't be paying the 5, the 10, the 20, the 30 percent uh, interest on all this stuff, but we will be utilizing that for the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of darkness, you see. 
So, Father, I thank you today. I praise you. I thank you that those that do not have seed to sow, you will provide seed for them. I thank you today that this is for the gospel's sake, that you promise, that you promise a hundredfold in this lifetime. So, Father, I believe for that, for the sowing today. I believe your covenant rights go above every other natural fact, and that supernatural intervention comes because of the obedience in the hearts of the people. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all just bring it on down to the front. Children can be released to go to their own service. First of all, I want to thank all the ones that's gone through transition. I know that some of you come out of no background as far as Christianity. I know some of you come out of conservative type background. My wife come from Ireland, brought up Catholic. I know. Some of you come out of Baptist. Some of you just were total lost. Some of you even came from the synagogue. But let me tell you this. God's brought us all to a position in him. The walls have been torn down. Jesus said, I'll tear down that wall between you if you'll let me. And I will open up my revelation to you that I can blend you into one body and that you can be very effective and I will position you with authority in my name to do mighty exploits. And a lot of times the devil will try to remind you of your past and I've got a little thing here, I've read it a long time ago about focusing your energy on your future because what you do today will determine your future outcome. And your thought life today will determine what you do tomorrow. And uh, I want us to become faith thinkers. I want us to begin Bible thinkers. I want us to begin to have revelation come to us like never before. And I want to read this deal about Ruth and, and uh, Boaz and, and uh, how they came. Because some of you might not have come from the greatest background. Uh, I, I'm thinking about Ramon, our good friend that's up and running and he came here and gave his testimony and, and, uh, and his background wasn't the greatest facing two life terms and uh, uh, working in the Mexican drug cartel for all those years and mad at society and the human race and, and in jail. I mean his background just wasn't very good. It, it didn't look like it was a background that would lead to a man getting up proclaiming the love of God and the provision of God and the faithfulness of God. But in the Maricani Copa Jail, uh, believe it or not, God invaded and it was no different from the three Hebrew children. When he was in the jail, wherever it was in, in the valley, he went in jail. Well, God was already there when he went in the fiery furnace and, and he, began, he fell on his face and he began to to ask and cry out to God. And he'd been brought up Catholic and he, I can remember his words. He said, God, I've never done nothing for you, but you've kept me alive. I want to turn to you. And he was facing sentencing. He didn't know what he was going to get sentenced to, but his background 
didn't look good for his future. And of course, he got several sentences, and I think two life sentences. And, uh, well, there's a debate on that. It doesn't matter. I guess if you've got one life, whether you had two, three, or 15, it makes no difference because he was never supposed to get out of prison. He controlled the drugs that come across the Arizona border. He was a mean man until Jesus changed his nature. And it happened in the twinkling of an eye on a bed in the county jail or wherever he was at when he cried out to Jesus. Jesus did not hold his past against him. He accepted him and created him a future full of hope, position of authority. And I wanted to read this to you because so many people think they have been violated in a way because of their past that they can never amount to anything in the things of God or anything else. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. Ruth created a future far different from her past. Ruth was a Moabite girl raised as a heathen. Moab was a son of incest between Lot and his daughter. She married Boaz, who one writer said had come through the loins of a temple prostitute by the name of Rahab. I don't know for sure, but that's what one writer said. God put them together and ushered in the lineage of Jesus Christ. One from incest, one from a prostitute. Ruth and Boaz produced Obed. Obed produced Jesse. Jesse produced David. David ushered in the lineage of Jesus Christ. But who was Ruth? I would say that her past said she was a nobody. She would never amount to anything. She was not in the class system, right? She didn't meet the standards of the day according to the public. But Ruth was the grand, great-grandmother of David, the greatest warrior Israel had ever known. She was the great-great-grandmother of one of the wisest men who ever lived, Solomon. And through her and Boaz came the precious son of the living God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. God never consults your past to decide your future. We do all the time. We need to quit it. Satan may remind you of your yesterday's mistakes. If I'd have only done it different, if I'd have only done this, I made a horrible mistake, I did this, and it throws you into depression, and all of a sudden it stymies you, and you stop going forward. Don't listen to him anymore. God never reads your diary on a daily basis or your past. Your past is over. People in the church just weights me down because of their past. Jesus dealt with your past. Jesus set you free. Jesus it said, behold, the old's gone, according to 2 Corinthians 5, and behold, all is new, and it is of God. You got something new inside of you. Quit digging up the past. You need to act like it, talk like it, live like it. Your best days are ahead of you. I don't care what the economy says. I don't care what jerk we've got running the nation. It doesn't make any difference. Your God is on your side. You say, you're using uh, irreverent words toward our leader. He is irreverent. A man that would institute partial birth abortion the first 30 minutes of his reign is ungodly. A man that wants to liberalize our whole nation and let Sharia law become the law of this nation is ungodly. When we've got a man that hides behind the only little short time that he was a Christian and hide behind that and say, oh yeah, praise God, thank God, I just want to get elected again, is ungodly. So what I'm saying is this, you got a future. It makes no difference what it looks like in this nation. 
you've got the authority of God to be positioned right because he's already legally done it, that you can rise up and he will wipe away your past and show you your future. You see, when you made Jesus the Lord of your life, Colossians 1.13 says, you were delivered from the power of darkness and what's the problem? What is the problem? If God Almighty, through this scripture, everybody believes this is God breathed, right? The word of the living God. And in Colossians 1.13 says, you've been delivered from the power of darkness. Say, I've been delivered from the power of darkness. The word power is literally translated there is authority. Satan has no authority over the church anymore. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell, that means the governing body, gates, when you said in the gate they made the laws, that meant the governing body of the kingdom of darkness could not prevail against you. You're the church. It don't mean an iron gate. It means a gate of dark authority, the kingdom of darkness. It cannot supersede the kingdom of light which you represent. Our positioning as believers actually gives us authority to take charge and take back everything that the enemy's trying to rob from us. You have been delivered from the power, authority of darkness and placed into God's kingdom. Jesus said this. I was corrected on this. I'm going to write God and ask him about this. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So now you go ye therefore and preach this gospel in the same works that I do and greater than these you'll be able to do because of the authority I'm delegating to you. Matthew 28, 18, 19, the power was given to us as part of our inheritance when we come to Christ. You entered into a great thing with God, by the way. I ordered this book, and I know it's far out for most of you, called Quantum Faith. It's based on quantum physics concerning sound and words. And I know some of you read it and laugh. Some of you read it and expand your vision and be, do mighty exploits like you never thought of before. Matter of fact, right now, uh, everybody that wants one, raise your hand and pass them out. I bought them through the church for y'all. It cost you nothing. I'll tell you what, everything's made up of matter. Everything's affected. You can walk into a room because of your authority and you can cause peace to come over and drive out sadness and sickness. This right here will help you. If For you that can't go that far, at least it will be an amusing read. Amen? You're welcome. You have entered into a position of authority because you are in him and he is in you. You understand that? The word says that the righteousness has come upon all men according to the word of the living God. That means we have right standing. You may ask, then, why don't all become righteous? Because in order to receive it, you have to act on it, and righteousness comes from a point of authority. I'll just wait a minute. <clears throat> I remember back 15 or 20 years ago when I was 16 years old, a joke. I know nobody believes it. So, <laughs> about 1960, in the Godly Assembly of God Church, sitting toward the back, the back two rows had them planked bleacher. You know, plank. We what? We didn't. People sat on the back row had to suffer. And then when you on up front had those nice pews. But the ones in the back, the men of the church had made out of like one befores. And 
I was sitting back there and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost come upon me. And I had a transformation and I made a decision to follow Christ, to accept him, to have Jesus be the Lord of my life. What year is this? 2011. It's been a few years ago, 1960. But something happened into me that would not be reversed or, or pulled back. The Holy Spirit came in and took out an old heart of sin and put in a heart with the nature of God in it and gave me the opportunity to begin to renew my mind with the word of God so that my actions would transform and line up with the word of the living God. Amen? So at that moment, righteousness had been upon me. All of a sudden, had come inside me. See, righteousness is on and for everyone, but it has to be accepted. You have to accept Jesus before the transforming work of it comes inside of you. So when I was made the righteousness of God in Christ, according to 2 Corinthians, you know, it, in 1 Corinthians there, it talks about we become ambassadors, we become representatives of God. Things begin to, to unfold. God begins to speak to us. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What happened then? People, I think, sometimes don't realize that when you come willingly, when you come believing, when you come with an open heart and you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, you get up different. You're a different human being. The real you, the spirit man, is changed. But then we got to renew the mind so our minds will be transformed to act and walk in line with what's happened. Jesus secured the power and authority on the cross of Calvary in his death, burial, and resurrection. He succeeded in securing all the power we needed, all power in heaven and in earth. You see, I know he died a horrible death. I know the suffering for the penalty of sin was great, the sin nature. So many people look at individuals and they see them knowing that they've accepted Jesus to commit a sin act, and that's wrong too. But what's different is maybe their mind's not renewed to the point to where they can make proper decisions led by the Spirit of God so they do a sin act. That's not what I'm talking about when Jesus died. He died for the nature of sin. He died for original sin. He died for the nature that's inside of you. And he died, and when you accept his sacrifice, whenever you accept his blood, whenever you accept the redeeming blood of the lamb, your nature of sin has changed to the nature of God. Then, Romans 12 comes in, you must renew, renew the mind to the fact of what's happened inside of you so that you can be transformed in all of your decision making. What you do, you quit acting like a lost person, one governed by, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, governed only by human impulse. You're governed by spirit impulse because your mind's hooked up with it through the word of the living God. Amen? So he came to earth as a man for one reason, to recapture the authority Satan had stolen through Adam's disobedience in the garden. You see, he is repositioning the church. He's repositioning his people through his death, burial, and resurrection. He's given us the opportunity to be men and women of authority, his authority. After securing the power and the authority, he freely gave it over into the hands of those who would believe him. And that means you, Sam Odom, and me, and everyone else in this building that would believe on his name and come to him has been given authority. But the problem is most of the church do not realize that. They're still living far below their God-given rights to stand up and take charge of their area of influence, of the marketplace, of the church, of the government, whatever it might be, God wants us to impact and influence those areas. 
through his presence by giving us authority to be there. It's not enough to simply accept Jesus' work at Calvary. We're held responsible for more, much more than that according to the word of God. He said, I'm doing this so you can do that. It's not just a be fuzzy feeling and come around and sing a little bit and do a few little things and never do nothing for the kingdom. I've heard five million times, no, that's a lie. Forgive me, Lord. Thousands of times, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't have to go to church. Matthew 24 said this. How will we know your coming is near? Many will be deceived. The first thing out of his voice, out of his mouth, the, it, it, that took precedence over wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, all the natural catastrophe. He said the best way you can tell, many will be deceived. And if there's not many deceived today, I don't know what it is. We got a world full of deception. And we need to wake up and say, Lord, help me. You said you'd not do anything unless you reveal it to your people, your prophets, the men and women of God. I need some in input. I need some revelation. I need to follow you. How do we approach this, this season? His words are just as vital and real today as they were spoken back in Mark 15 and 16. Jesus appeared to his disciples after the resurrection of the dead and his words to them from the basic foundation of the work of the New Testament, it was at that time he delegated authority to the church and it hasn't changed. Do you understand what I'm saying? Beginning in verse 15, Jesus said, Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But if you don't believe, you're not going to be saved. You'll be damned. That's what it says. He that believeth is baptized and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Moaning and groaning and belly aching. <laughs> I'm sorry. I never will forget Brother Hagin telling this story. He had an old Oldsmobile and had been in West Texas preaching and the tires were wore plumb out and it was about 110 degrees. And he got through with his meetings and he got 50 cents, I think he said, in the meeting. Not enough to buy for gas or nothing to go with the meeting. And the words of the devil in his own mind because he got to hearing, you know how those tires at about 100 degrees or 110 degrees, they slap that, that seam in the, in the road, that tar seam in a concrete road. And all he could hear after he'd preached three or four days, what you gonna do now? What you gonna do now? What you gonna do now? You going home, have no money. The tires are wore out. What you gonna do now? And of course, he stood as much as that and he took charge over his mind and over his thoughts. And he began to scream out, I'm going to believe God. I'm going to have faith in God. I believe that all my needs are supplied according to his riches and glory. I put a demand on the covenant of the living God. I'll not listen to that voice any longer. I'm not going to listen that he comes up and tries to tell me now if you'd have went somewhere else maybe the offering would have been bigger. No my trust is not in the offering. My trust is in God Almighty. You see what you going to do now? What are you going to do now? And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name they will cast out devils and as far as my personal belief my opinion, if you want me to give it, and you don't have to take it, but I, I guess I'm going to give it anyway. But you don't have to believe it. Been in Pentecostalism all my life, the Assembly of God Church all the way up, going through the charismatic movement, preaching in different places all over the world, being on my face, asking God how, how to go forward. The biggest problem that happened is the devil convinced pastors 
that it didn't look right to cast devils and demons out of people in the church. And the first thing that Jesus said was deal with the problem, deal with the enemy, cast the demons out of them, and then get them saved and baptized in the Holy Ghost and begin to speak in other tongues and be empowered to be a witness just like you are. You see, it, it talks about taking up serpents and people get off, but that's talking about a picture of the demons that come after you. Also, it talked about Paul back in those days, you might get latched on to by a serpent like he did on the, on the apostle Paul. He shook it off. They fainted. He shook it off in the fire. Everybody fainted. Oh, there's watching for him to drop dead the next 30 seconds. And he just, he remembered what God had told him. That no harm will come near his tent. He'll complete what he's been called to do and be. And no harm, no serpent, no nothing will hurt him because he has a mission that God has given just like you've got a mission that God's given you. Are you fulfilling it? Do you know about the authority? Do you know how to walk in the authority God's given you? I'm asking the question, are you just a religious sound and a sounding symbol affecting nothing? Amen. That might have been a little rebuke. <laughs> That could have been a little rebuke. You know, the word of God is good. It's been given for instruction, correction or rebuke, and exhortation. I'm going to exhort you in just a minute after you repent for not doing nothing to get out there and do something. <laughs> now you're equipped. <laughs> I asked Sister Sprague and Brother Sprague, they was my spiritual parents in, in Tulsa, and, and uh, I... Well, I won't tell you what I asked them. They, they would tell me, if you've got a bad garden growing, don't let your pride stand in your way. The only way to get rid of it is come willfully before God and repent from your heart. Say, Lord, I know you was telling me to do it. I know. I, I mean, the sin of not doing something can be greater than the sin of doing something wrong. The sin of not doing something in this day and time is greater than you making a mistake. The sin of not rising up and saying, no, our church, our nation will not be taken over by foreign gods or belief. We will stand strong because we've still got time to get the gospel around the world and stand up and still send men and women empowered with the authority talking here to preach a gospel that'll bring deliverance and freedom and not a socialized gospel of programs. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover and not die. And this was just to get us started according to Hebrews 5. That's just to get you twicked a little bit. And then he says, come on. In Hebrews 5, he said, now that you've learned this other stuff, the laying on of hands, none of y'all should be sick anymore. Let's advance on to a higher level of understanding. Hebrews said, he said, let's get, now some of you need to begin to be teachers. You should have already been teaching. You should have already been doing that. But I'm calling you and I'm setting you free that you begin to teach. You begin to exhort. You begin to, to train. You begin to rise up in your neighborhood. You begin to take the authority that I've given you. And, and let's get past the elementary doctrines of Christ. If this isn't a season for that, I've never seen it. A lot of you baby boomers out here have been around for 50, 60, 70 years. It's time to stop and let God shake your chain and get yourself back on board because you've got the power and the presence of God in you. You've even got the training. you just got to get the willpower and the passion to do it. Amen? God will back you up. We have authority to preach this gospel, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I mean, 
why do we have to go to foreign lands to see miracles? We don't here. We've had every kind of miracle in the world happen right here. But I remember that 24-year-old girl that had never spoken to her in India when we was praying and Mark and Pat was there and uh, Patricia and I was there and the mother brought her to the healing line and we'd already prayed for several hundred people and and I remember the first words when, when the power of this gospel impacted her life and impacted her ears and the and the the very nerves in her ears and recreated whatever needed to be recreated and then give her the unction to speak. The first word out of her mouth was Jesus, Jesus. And her mother began to weep and, and she, she had been, you know, dumb and couldn't hear and, and, and couldn't talk and, and she began to speak because of the power of a gospel that has been taken nearly out of the church and men and women have been deceived not knowing that In the name of the Lord, if you will get with him and be willing and obedient to walk in the things of God, you will be a catalyst in which God will use in this season to help organize the church, help organize men and women, help teach and exhort men and women to do what's right, and also don't limit God in their life. You see. Believers are the ones with the power and authority to do things. I mean, when Peter got transformed, he didn't go to Bible school. He didn't go to university. All he did was go to the upper room and obey God. And all of a sudden, bam, the Holy Ghost hit him. He began to get transformed. And then he began to preach that day. Everybody marveled. Wasn't this the guy that denied Jesus? Well, you might say that. But there's something else in him now that's working. There's something else in there. That old nature's gone and God moved in and he's understanding the authority that he has now. And all of a sudden when he opens his mouth, the anointing of God that's on him transforms men and women and it lets faith rise for salvation of deliverance. You see. God will confirm his word, but first it has to be spoken forth. That is why that our government is subtly trying to take the voice of the church away. I was just talking to someone yesterday and he just read the latest articles in England and now... If you say anything about Islam, just a little bit, they put you in jail. Not a fine, you go to jail. We got the same hate law that Obama signed into law. It's just subtle. See, they don't come and cut your head off the first day. They wait till they get the authority to do so because the church has not understood its authority, but the devil's bunch does. So, what is the cry that goes forth? The first cry is, oh Lord, help me. I want to know. I want to go. Hear my Lord. Pick the coal up off that altar like he did Isaiah. If you need to do something, touch my lips that I can begin to speak with a tongue that is powerful. And And I need to have the prayer of Paul coming through. Oh Lord, help me to speak the way I ought to speak. Don't be so politically correct. Y'all that wasn't here and heard my story Wednesday night, Tuesday night. Of course, we worked in the valley down there. We got people working for us in the valley because I'm a general contractor. And so I stay in the motor home and Patricia's usually with me. But she was up here with our daughter Tuesday night. And I'm walking, getting my exercise about 6.15. Man, I am out there praising God and walking around. And the neighbor, which we'd never met, was sitting under his carport. And the neighbor, hey, come on over and sit down. And, I, and there was one chair left. And I sat down and there was a people there from South Dakota, uh, from Minnesota, from Canada, and other places. And we just talked two minutes. I mean, I, I just sat down. And they said, what do you think about uh, our, the condition of our nation? They didn't know who they was talking to. 
I said, I've just been studying about, we got 11 to 15 states or more than that that's got, they're, they're thinking of implementing, Oklahoma's one of them, implementing Sharia law into our governing system. As a matter of fact, 70% of Oklahomans voted against it, and one radical federal judge overruled it, said it was unconstitutional. They will use Sharia law. And then I'm talking about this. I'm, I've, I've been over there watching O'Reilly. He's interviewing this woman from Libya that just nearly got killed talking about Sharia law, and then he's got the leader of of the Muslims from Washington or Oregon on there trying to defend the Koran. And, and O'Reilly's just said, I'm reading from the Koran. It says that if you've got a wife, I, they can beat you at random. You can't get a divorce. You, I, we'll beat you. And if, I mean, it, he read it. And so I said, We're, we got three areas, apathy. We've got a man leading our country that's a socialist. And then Islam has been on the attack of jihad for 30 years against our nation. And the people are asleep. This man sitting at the end of the table sprung out of his seat. Got up. I'm tired, he said. I said, are y'all Muslim? I asked him. Well, I know he was. I said, are y'all Muslim or something? That's the guy that was from Canada. And they all got up, every one of them, and left me sitting under their carport as they cleaned the table off, whispering between one another. In five minutes, I was sitting alone. I was. I've never encountered anything quite. They never said another word to me. I'm, I'm telling you to now, they've never said another word to me. Now, the retired superintendent from South Dakota was going to the restroom. He came back. He said, what happened? I said, I think I set off a bomb here. I think maybe some are Muslim or whatever. He said, let's go over to your motor home. I want to talk more because he said, I'm a real conservative superintendent, retired. said, a lot of the superintendents are very liberal and said that I've never seen such apathy and people with their head in the sand as the people I, I meet across America. I said the church has to wake up and Americans that, that care about their way of life. And we talked. I didn't say anything out of line. I didn't think, but I said something that crossed their bow, either one of two things. They won't want to hear it because they don't want to get involved or either they're involved on the other side. In this day and time, if you're going to make a difference, you will make a wave in the religious community. I'm going to finish. I got 15 more pages of notes. But I'm quitting. Because I can take up right there next week. I'm going to tell you something. God, through the second Adam, repositioned us and give us authority to take charge of the land. And unless we're willing to do something, our enemies will take it. And it's not just a natural enemy. It's an organized, demonic plan to destroy humanity in the way we know it. And I feel, I've already repented because I've been a, a guy trying to get people to walk by faith for 35 years, watch what they say and declare the fullness of God in the word of God. I've shifted gears. I'm an all out radical right wing Christian that wants to attack what is being fed to us as truth, but really deception. If we don't, as Christian men and women, they will.
I know that for a fact. Amen. And what are we going to do? Well, we're going to pray first. We're going to get involved in the political process for 2012. We're going to pray and ask God to give us the right candidates. And then we're going to vote from our heart, just like God says. And then we're going to be willing to stand up for Governor Brewer. And we're going to get a contingency of people to invade Phoenix and the capital and say, Governor Brewer, we're behind you 100%. We will have a day of prayer in Arizona and no liberals will stop it. But no Christians have come out down there. There's nobody on the, on the steps to try to say, we support you. We'll put our time, our money, and our efforts, and we'll call on God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that's given us authority, and this will not continue. Amen. We've gone long enough, 60 years, and allow the liberals, the atheists, to rule our country, and we sit back as good little godly people, and it's time to quit. It's time to get a word from God. Amen. It's time to say, Lord, here, I, I had a lot of training. I never saw it like this. I didn't realize I was refusing to let you speak to me about confrontation. <laughs> See, there is, we're, we have lack of knowledge concerning our enemies, and our enemy, number one, is Satan but he will hold back nothing to cripple, to bring the power down, what, or get you to procrastinate. I said the biggest enemy of the devil is procrastination. Delay your destiny. Delay the destiny of the church. Delay the power of God from flowing through you. Let everything else take precedence over what God's called you to be and do. Let me tell you what, you put God first place in serving him and studying, letting the Holy Spirit in your prayer life and he'll make up your other life. God is real, he's alive. Is there anybody in this house that's never encountered Jesus? Is there anybody that's never invited Jesus in? righteousness in I think I know all of you is there anybody in this house that says pastor I want to raise my hand I want righteousness inside of me I want to know this Jesus I want to walk in this season in power and authority anybody everybody saved everybody know the Lord <clears throat> Jesus Christ of Nazareth is repositioning you, the church, to receive revelation and input like you never have. But he's also by his spirit strengthening you to do something with it when he gives it to you. It's called faith. Faith. When I think of our forefathers and the designing of that $1 bill and how all 13 of them involved, and, you know, and all the men involved, they gave their wealth and eventually their lives to establish a republic that God would be at the head of it. And what have we done? Because of our political correctness, because of our social lives, we've not been willing to stand up and say, no, devil, you're not going to take our land. We need to call a spade a spade, guys. Most of us are the ones that come up through the charismatic movement, come up through the word movement, come up through the Pentecostal movement of God, and what do we do? When somebody starts talking a little radical, getting nervous. Remember what the word radical comes from. Remember it comes from the Latin word radix. And if you look it up, it means come back to the core belief, the center. And the reason it seems radical is because it's, we lost our way so far from what happened on the day of Pentecost. He wants to pull us back. And it will seem radical to all denominations. It'll seem, but there will be people in every one of them raised up.
they'll all come from every sector. I don't have enough faith right now to believe that leaders will change, but I think the people will. But what I'm saying is this. Please pray. Please breathe. Read that little book, because next week we're going to talk about sound. And that what's that guy's name that fizz Coverin? Is that how you, we did a Van Covering? He is a scientist, and he did a, another uh, experiment, a, a run a whole deal on sound. It all lines up with Bible. Amen. Sound affects everything. Why do you think we blow the so far? Sound signal to call. Everybody knew what it meant. There's about eight different sounds. It's a so far. The one I want to sound now is a call to war Amen. against our enemies. But what we got to make sure, because we get a pattern from the children of Israel, are we with God or are we away from him? Because if we're with him, they never lost a battle. We don't want to be ignorant in apathy and just walk out there and say, oh, just because we're Christian, we wouldn't. No, if you be willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land and you'll, you will actually eat the spoils of your enemy. Amen. 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 Well, praise God. Give him some praise, would you? <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to have communion now and we're going to remember what Jesus has done and his death, burial, and resurrection till he comes again. And guys, he may come pretty soon. Amen. We got a promise, and he'll keep it. You know, this might be a real good time because the Lord Jesus said that when you come together and you take communion and remember the death of the Lord till he comes again, he said, judge yourself. He said, if, if you'll take a personal inventory of what you've either been doing or refusing to do, and then if you'll ask him to forgive you, he'll forgive you and cleanse you of all sin, known and unknown. Another big deception is letting our spiritual pride get in the way and not acknowledging that we do need to have some new, fresh direction. Jesus was always saying, you know, judge the fruit of a thing. Well, we might ought to get back and get before God get over in the book of James, begin to pray in the Holy Ghost and ask for God to give us some wisdom how to live our life now. And, and let the church become a church full of fruit. That means operate in the power and authority of Almighty God like never before. No different than on the day of Pentecost. may not get on certain TV stations but the thing about it is God might open our own station up. we need our own radio station my wife and I used to work for David Ingalls KYND KN, KYND wasn't it? it's amazing what how good radio is medium of communication I tried to buy that little station from Kevin to get it up here in our building so we'd have our own station but from our building it reached Snowflake, Taylor all around because we're high up maybe he needs some money I want a radical station, one that challenges the Christian community. Let's get on our own house first. You say, 
why are you like that? This is like old time Pentecost. No, it didn't. I'm not talking about you women having to wear long sleeves and have your hair in a bun. I mean, some of you might need it, but the thing about it is, <laughs> what I'm talking about is an inward change. I'm talking about the power of God in you. And yeah, it will eventually affect your outward appearance. But if we don't focus on the right things, we'll lose the main thing. Jesus died for transformation. And he's still transforming us. Now, Father God, I ask that you give me strength to speak boldly. Forgive me for times that I could have been with you and I just didn't do it. And Father, for causes you showed me and I I didn't move forward on. Forgive me, Lord, because from this day forward, as you empower me, I'll never back up. I ask that every person in this building, as they pray their own prayer silently, that we drop prideful religious things. And Father, that let men understand they can be actually be wrong and you can be right. And heal the families. Bring resolution to conflict and bring an understanding of who the body of Christ really is and the authority we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Take the bread and the wine. The ushers will pick up the cups. We're believing God for radio media to open up. All, all that know me, we've done a lot of radio.